Uh, I would invite you, if you are able, as we go to God's word, to kneel with me and pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for the privilege it is to come and to worship you, a holy and amazing God. God, it's easy for us to look past how amazing you are, how holy you are. God, as we wrestle with a difficult text today, our prayer is that you will speak in a profound and powerful way. Help us to get a glimpse of your glory. God, we pray that you will speak, that I will get out of the way. It's the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. A human pastime that has existed for a really long time is to try and show off ourselves to other people. It happens from a very, very early age. If you've ever had a toddler, you know that they like to say the phrase, look at this, mommy, or look at this, daddy. And then they do something, and then you just kind of look at it, and you're like, is, is that it? Oh, that's great. That's amazing. My younger sister, she once said that 95% of having a toddler is saying, oh, wow, that's amazing, to things that are objectively not amazing. And as we get older, it doesn't go away. We like to show off those things that, that we like about ourselves, the things that, that we want other people to know about ourselves. And social media has just amplified that. That with Instagram and with Facebook and whatever social media platform you have, we like to let people know how great our lifestyle is. I'm not saying that's you, but I'm saying there are some people out there that they like to brag a little bit. They like to use their social media to, to show you that I get to go on vacations that maybe you don't get to go on. And that maybe my life is just a whole lot better than yours is. There was an interesting trend that happened over in Russia, uh, Serbia specifically. It's a, a place called the Novoski Maldives. That's what they called it. But over there on social media, th this beautiful, amazing-looking lake became the backdrop to all kinds of Instagram photos, all kinds of Facebook photos. So you, you see there in the photo, you've got a newlywed couple. They decided to go take their their marriage pictures there. You've got what looks like just the normal Instagram couple of look how awesome our life is. And that lake looks so beautiful. It's got that turquoise just, I mean, looks pristine. What you can't see in the photos is that right next to the lake is a giant toxic manufacturing plant. And the thing that's causing that water to be so turquoise is actually the nuclear waste that's coming from, <laughs> from that chemical plant. And so this, this company, it's this ash dump that's just putting these toxic chemicals into the water. They know that's why it's turquoise. They're trying to get these people to stay out of there. So they start posting all of these signs and saying, stay out, toxic, it's dangerous. And that didn't slow down anybody from going and taking photos. So they knew that it was toxic. They knew that it was deadly. But they didn't care so long as it made their photo look good. I think sometimes in life we do the same thing with our sins. That maybe there's some area in our life that we're wrestling with that we haven't quite figured out. And instead of recognizing that it's toxic, recognizing that it's deadly, recognizing that it's something that kills and destroys, we do the opposite. We try and put on a front that makes it seem like it's just not that big of a deal. Or maybe even worse, we make it seem like it's actually this positive or good thing. Today we're going to wrestle with a text that's not an easy text. It's not a warm, fuzzy text. We're going to look at the character Ezekiel, and really specifically his book and what God spoke to him. Now, probably Ezekiel is not your favorite book in the Bible. There's not very many people that when they think of, man, if I was stuck on a deserted island and I only had one book in the Bible, Ezekiel, that's just my go-to. It's a hard book. Hebrew rabbis, when, when they were learning the, the Bible, that they would not be allowed to study the book of Ezekiel. They prevented them from studying it until after the age of 30. Why? Because it's such a difficult text. There's so much weird, crazy imagery going on. They were worried that, that a young Hebrew man would struggle with it so much that he would get frustrated and not fall in love with the rest of God's law. That's how difficult this text is. So before we dive in, let's catch up a little bit on the history of Israel because the time in which Ezekiel is writing is very important to understanding the rest of the book. 
So as we're going through the chronological Bible study, what happens back in 975 B.C. is this, this huge moment that then the rest of understanding the Old Testament, you, you, you got to see in context of that moment. So let's back up a little bit to King Saul. Saul is the first king of Israel. They become this nation. They want a king. They go and they complain to Samuel. God anoints Saul as the first king. Not a great king. But then comes David, who is a great king. He loves God. David has a a number of different sons. But Solomon becomes the next king over all of Israel. Solomon expands the nation with wealth and prosperity. He's a wise king. But after Solomon... There's disaster. There's no succession planning. There's this bickering and fighting. And what happens is Israel splits in half. So for the rest of the text, we're looking at the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So the northern kingdom, if we'll pull up the timeline, the northern kingdom, uh, this is now called Israel. So this is ten different tribes that split off and create Israel. Israel is where we have uh, Elijah and Elisha. They're doing their ministry in those ten northern kingdoms. That The book of Jonah happens up here. Now, this nation is always turning against God. Like, they have ungodly king after ungodly king after ungodly king. And so, although they're called Israel... And they are having these prophets that come over and over and come to them. They don't follow after God. And in 722 B.C., the Assyrians come, take them over, take them into captivity, and they're never heard from again. They disappear. Sometimes they're called the ten lost tribes of Israel because they get taken into captivity and then they they marry off and then they're just gone. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God sets up what's called the Mosaic Covenant. He tells his people, I want you to be a light to the world. I want you to be set apart and different. And then he gives them this this specific understanding of the covenant. He says, if you love me, if you will follow my covenant, then your enemies will be my enemies and I will protect you. But if you don't love me, if you don't follow my covenant, then your enemies will come, take you captive, and you will disappear. And that's exactly what happens to the northern kingdom of Israel. Now the southern kingdom, that's the kingdom of Judah. That's just two tribes, the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. Uh, historically, when, when you think of the term Jew, that comes from Judah. We're not exactly sure when exactly that term comes into being, but it comes from this southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, that a lot of books that, that we read through are happening in the southern kingdom. The book of Isaiah is a great book because it shows that there were godly kings that rose up in the southern kingdom. Hezekiah is an example of that. He's in the book of Isaiah and he follows after God. So as a result of that, they last a whole lot longer than that northern kingdom. The books of Ezekiel take place here. The book of Jeremiah, the book of Daniel. But what happens after Hezekiah is he has a son named Manasseh who is not a godly king. He is one of the most wicked kings in the history of Judah, the history of Israel. And what happens next is bad. That Babylon comes and takes them captive. We're going to pick up in Ezekiel chapter 1. It's going to give us a little bit of context to what's going on. Ezekiel chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kabar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, on which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Okay, a few specific important things that that help us understand the moment in time this is. So Jehoiakim, he was the king. His father was king. He was only 21 years old when his father dies fighting against Babylon. He becomes the king now. Babylon is knocking at the door, and he surrenders to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, he calls them the Chaldeans. Chaldeans and Chaldeans and Babylonians get interchanged here because there's actually two different kind of variations of Babylon. So Babylon rises up, and then they get beat down, and then Babylon comes back, now sometimes called the Chaldeans. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar's leading that charge and they fall to the Babylonians. So 10,000 
People from Judah get taken into exile, get taken into captivity. Ezekiel is one of these. That first phrase, he says, in the 30th year. We're not 100% sure what that means, but most scholars think it's talking about his birthday. That he's naming that this is my 30th year, it's my birthday, which is significant to Ezekiel because if he was back in Judah, then he would have become a priest. That was the age that he could become a priest. Unfortunately, he's not in Judah. He's in captivity. He's in this low part of his life. He's sitting by this river. The Kabar River was really a canal that came off of a river. He's by his refugee camp. He's probably having a pity party. He's wondering what's going to happen. And then he has this vision from God. Now, it's a crazy vision. It's a difficult to understand. But the first chapter is really important to understand what's happening in the rest of the book. Take a look in verse 4. It says, then I looked and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber and out of the midst of the fire. Now, a a few very important details come in that verse, that this chariot or whatever it is that's raging fire is coming from the north. Now, both for Judah and Israel, the north is where the bad guys came from. The north is always where enemies of Judah or Israel came to try and take them captive. So for Ezekiel, he's seen something that is completely unexpected. At that time, they believed that God's presence was only in the temple. That that Judah always kind of thought that, look, we've got Jerusalem The the northern kingdom, yeah, they got taken captive, but they didn't have Jerusalem. They didn't have the temple. They didn't have God's presence. But what Ezekiel is seeing is that God's presence is outside the temple. And it's coming from the north. God's presence is coming as an enemy of Judah. And it's coming with raging fire. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Raging fire is this, this symbol of judgment. And then he describes what he sees, and he keeps using this phrase, it was like the likeness of. He, he doesn't really understand how he can explain it. And so he's recognizing that and saying, this isn't exactly what it was, but it was, it was something similar or like this. And he describes these four cherubim, these four angels with four wings and four heads with four faces that are all making the underneath of this chariot, that they're, they're locked together. Now, we sometimes think of cherubim, we think of angels that that are little chubby fat babies that that have little wings and are just kind of floating around like this that the picture in the old testament specifically here with ezekiel the, the cherubim these were guardians of god's holiness that they are these fearsome looking creatures that they have these four faces and these four faces are representing all the best attributes in creation So you have the face of a man, the face of intellect, the face of this lion, this fierceness, the face of an ox, strength, the face of the eagle, speed, agility. And then beneath these four angels that are are locked together holding up this chariot are these wheels, except they're not like normal wheels. It's a wheel inside a wheel, and they're spinning in all kinds of different directions. And it says that they were going all around the world, but they never turned sideways. They were always going forward. That it's this picture that that God is omnipresent. That God's presence is all over the world, recognizing everything that's going on all the time. And on the wheels were these eyes that were looking in every direction. That, That God is omniscient. He knows everything that is going on and everything that is happening. And then at the very end of chapter 1, look down in verse 28. He says this to describe God. Now, now anytime in the Old Testament that it's describing human characteristics of God, it, it's a theophany. It's, it's this way of trying to basically dumb things down for our understanding. So like when it says the hand of God, that doesn't mean it's this literal hand of God. It, it means that this is the best way for us as humans to grasp and understand what's happening. So he's trying to explain this physical manifestation of God and God's presence. And here's what he writes. Verse 28, like the appearance of a rainbow... In a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, 
I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. Now, the big picture to get in Ezekiel is to not get obsessed with the details. You can get obsessed with the details and then you have no clue what's going on. Like there's these weird play theatrical things that Ezekiel does over and over again. And if you really obsess with the details, you'll miss the whole thing. But the big picture of Ezekiel is this. That God is a holy God, and a holy God, by his very character and nature, is a righteous God. And evil cannot go unpunished. It might go unpunished for the moment, but eventually God must see evil punished. Now, the same time Ezekiel is prophesying, we've got Jeremiah going on, so, so we get a little more context. You see, Judah, back in Judah, they were thinking that God was about to come save them. God was about to come rescue them. He should come beat Babylon. They were this evil, wicked people, and yet they still thought God was somehow going to triumph at the end of the day. But Ezekiel sees something completely different. He's warning the people that God sees our sin. We've broken the Mosaic Covenant, and he's coming not to save us, but to judge us in wrath. And in fire. That what Ezekiel sees here in chapter 1. He sees the majesty and the glory. The awe of God. But he sees it in fear and trembling. And that's why he's falling on his face. Anytime in scripture when we see the glory of God revealed. The presence of God. uh, What we realize is that we are far, far smaller than we realize. And God is far, far bigger than we realize. Sometimes we'll try and vainly explain the the vast difference between humans and God. We'll we'll say something like this. We'll say, imagine the difference between a mosquito and a human. That's the same difference between man and God. But here's the problem where that falls flat. The mosquito is finite and man is finite. So there's a measurable difference. You can compare the difference between a mosquito and a human. But God is infinite. Comparing a finite human to an infinite God is impossible. He is infinitely greater than we are. So it's this recognition that God is so much bigger than we could ever possibly understand. And we can't understand God's ways. But we know that he is holy. And a holy God and a just God cannot have a relationship with ongoing unrepentant sin eventually It requires judgment. How do you know in a relationship that you have whether somebody loves you or not? Like think about any relationship that you've got. Maybe you're married, so a relationship inside a marriage. How do you know if your spouse loves you? Maybe it's a relationship with your kids or your parents or a coworker or a neighbor. How do you know if someone loves you? I went to Google. I started typing that in. How do you know if someone loves you? And the first thing that pops up in that autofill was how do you know if someone loves you and then autofilled on Facebook. <laughs> I thought, well, I don't know. Let me check it out. So I clicked enter. First article that popped up was this one. It said, here's some tips on whether someone likes you or has their eyes on someone else. I was like, oh, man, this is going to be some juicy stuff. Here's what it says. If they make their profile picture a picture with you, that is a positive sign. If they do this more than once, it's definitely a hint. They'll chat with you frequently on Facebook if they use Facebook chat. They'll comment on an old picture of you. Someone's scrolling down your timeline, checking out the old photos. All of a sudden they're liking. Things are getting pretty serious. It says they'll also be texting with you. They want to have this relationship. They're talking to you. It says they'll tell you they miss you even if you haven't been gone too long. And then this is my favorite one. It says they'll use emoticons or lots of exclamation marks in response to you. Note, guys generally don't use these nearly as much as girls do. Now, as I was reading through this, it kind of hit me. Who they are describing on Facebook is actually my mom. This, (laughs) this to a T, is my mom. But, But even... On social media, if you're trying to ask the question, does somebody love you, what does it come down to? It comes down to their actions, their thoughts, their words, what they're doing. 
You say that you love me, but does your lifestyle demonstrate a love for me? That's when we look at Ezekiel, we recognize that Judah might have said that they loved God, but their hearts were far from him. They were going against the covenant that they had with God, and so now God is coming in judgment. They think that he's coming to save them, and he's clear that he's not. So if we look at at the outline, the overview of Ezekiel, here's what happens. That chapters 1 through 3, that we we recognize his call. Then from chapter 3 through 24, there's judgment and doom. That this whole section of, of Ezekiel, that only takes about seven years, but it's happening at the same time that Judah... Back in Jerusalem, they start to rebel against Babylon. So as Ezekiel is saying, God is coming to judge and destroy us. Here is the judgment coming against Judah. Judah is rebelling against Babylon. Jerusalem comes under siege. Now from chapter 25 through 32, he goes on, he moves on from Judah and says, not only does God, being a righteous and just God, have to judge Judah for our evil, for our sin. He's also going to judge all the other nations of the world. So yes, those other nations, that they are not following after God, they will be judged as well. And then in chapter 33, this is this huge turning point. This is the moment in history where the 30-month siege of Jerusalem ends. This is the moment in history where the temple is destroyed. Jerusalem falls. The unthinkable happens. And in that moment, the bottom falls out. That Ezekiel's message was that God is coming in judgment and exactly what Ezekiel said was going to happen, happens. The book of Lamentations, where they're crying out to God in pain and sorrow, is from this very moment in time that Jerusalem and the temple falls. That God comes in wrath. That we have to recognize when we look at Ezekiel that sin is something that God utterly abhors. He has a disdain for sin. And us in our life, when we we jump forward in time, we've got to recognize that if we are Christians, that we need to love the things that God loves and we need to hate the things that God hates. Sometimes that's really hard. Sometimes it's difficult for us to do exactly that. Sometimes we have to have this spiritual checkup. Sometimes we've got to stop and evaluate and say, okay, God, what are the areas in my life that you're not happy with? There's this myth sometimes that says that, well, God hated sin in the Old Testament, but he doesn't hate it anymore in the New Testament. That's false. God hates sin just as much today as he ever did. If I'm a Christian and I have unrepentant sin in my life, I need to hate that. I need to be working on that. Why don't we? Sometimes it's really easy to call out sin in other people. Like it's not hard for me to recognize when somebody else has sin in their life. When someone else is doing something that they shouldn't do. Sometimes it's easy to see someone else that is more evil we we tend to compare sin we say well you know i'm maybe not great i'm maybe not living as holy life as i should but at least i'm not as bad as i mean everybody knows somebody that's worse than they are like you've got a cousin or a brother or an uncle or a co-worker and like yeah i mean there's some things i could work on but i mean i'm not as bad as that guy or maybe you are in fact the worst person that you know But historically, there's always somebody else. I mean, I'm a terrible person, but Hitler was worse than me. I mean, you know, I I always got that. And so we tend to try and downplay it. But here's what Ezekiel does to us. It makes us come face to face with this reality that God hates sin. He has a disdain for it. And we, if we're Christians, should have that same view. I I brought with me a, a couple different drinks my favorite drink is Dr. Pepper. Anybody out there like Dr. Pepper? I, I like Dr. Pepper because it, it goes with almost anything. I mean, you can wake up in the morning and have breakfast. Dr. Pepper's great for that. It's got caffeine in it. It's like coffee. You could go to lunch. What goes well with the sandwich? Dr. Pepper goes great with the sandwich. Having a steak, what pairs well with steak? Dr. Pepper does. Fish also pairs with that. So it's like this universal taste that works really, really well with everything. It's got kind of this, they say it's got, what, 23 flavors? All 23 flavors when they come to your mouth most of the time. 
They're fantastic. <laughs> Some of you want one right now, but nope, it's just for me. I also like milk. Anybody out there like milk? Some people think it's weird to drink milk. I like milk, specifically in cereal. Cereal is the most versatile of the food groups. You can have it for breakfast. You can also have it for dinner. Like you don't want to cook? Yeah, I'll just have cereal. It's also great for dessert. Lucky Charms, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. If you want a healthy cereal, Frosted Mini Wheats. So, so many, so many different options. But, but I, like, I like the taste of milk. I like to drink milk. Except for whatever reason, after having just drank Dr. Pepper, milk has a weird flavor to it. Like it just doesn't taste as clean as it normally does. But what's even worse is if you drink milk and then you try and drink Dr. Pepper. Oh, it's just awful. Like those 23 flavors, instead of having a party in your mouth, they're like fighting each other. They're like, what is going on in here? Like it just even, like you think that maybe that first sip, like it kind of washes it down, but mm, still bad. Like it's just like. This weird, like in the back of my throat, it's got like this weird film or something that's causing it. But now if I go back to milk, <laughs> let me just go ahead and tell you, a second ago it tasted really bad, but mm, it's like it tastes like sour milk now. Like, I know that this is not sour milk, I just bought it, and yet after drinking Dr. Pepper, it tastes very, very sour. Every time, every time. And so, now, back up for the illustration from a second, because I don't want to get weird emails. I'm not saying that one of these is God and one of these is sin, okay? So remove that part of the illustration from your mind. My point with you is that there are certain things that they do not go well together. One taste makes some other taste taste wrong. Something that is supposed to be sweet, Dr. Pepper, that after having milk, it's no longer sweet. It becomes even bitter, See, sometimes spiritually, here's what we do. We've got unresolved sin in our life. We've got unrepentant sin in our life that we're struggling with, we're wrestling with. Maybe nobody else knows it. Maybe it's something that we think is completely quiet. It's just ourselves that are wrestling with it. But then we come to church and we feel spiritually dry. We feel like it's just not working the way that it's supposed to. I don't feel like my relationship with God is alive. And so what do we do? We, we do what? It's natural for humans. We start to point the finger at other things and other people. We say, well, man, the music just isn't as good. Something about the worship service, it's just, it's not getting me alive the way that it used to. Or we say the preaching, the preaching, you know, it was, it was like here when I'm really wanting it to be here. And that's the reason I'm spiritually dry. Or maybe it's my Bible study. We start to blame other things instead of taking a step back and evaluating ourselves. You see, if we're a Christian, that moment we become a Christian is justification. And we stand pure and clean before God. But the rest of our life is sanctification. It's pursuing holiness. It's pursuing a relationship with God. And part of that pursuit is looking inward and trying to recognize what are those things in my life that aren't holy? How do I repent of them? How do I confess them to a group of people that can help me fight through those things? Chapter 33 in Ezekiel is this dark moment in the book when all hope seems lost. But then, chapter 34, he starts to turn the page towards hope. He starts to talk about this new King David that will one day come. That God's going to send a new king to redeem his people. In 36, he talks about a new heart. That God was going to give the people a new heart. A heart that could honor him and glorify him. And then in chapter 37, the most famous chapter in Ezekiel. Ezekiel gets brought in this vision to this valley of death. This valley of dry bones. And this is what God says in Ezekiel chapter 37. Starting in verse 1. It says, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. 
For Ezekiel, it wasn't a question of does God have the power to raise these dead bones to life. He knew that God had the power. He'd seen that time and time again. To Ezekiel, the question was, is it God's will for these dead bones to come back to life? That same question is true for us. That if you are apart from God, here's the reality of Scripture. When you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you stand before God as an enemy of God. That's not a warm, fuzzy thing. That's not something we like to to think on or meditate on. But that is the truth of the Bible. The bad news is that on our very, very best day, we are not nearly as good as we think we are. But there's hope. There's good news. You see, progressive revelation is understanding that the Bible is slowly God revealing himself to us. That it starts out with the big problem of creation, that we're separated away from God. But God tells us that we have eternity in our soul. We are born knowing that there's something else. Sometimes people think that the Old Testament has this God full of wrath, and the, Old Te- the New Testament is this God full of love, and, and how do those things coexist? But what you've got to understand is that the same God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Here's the difference, though. God came in wrath and in judgment and in rage in the New Testament, but instead of pouring out that wrath on those that deserved it, us, God pours out that wrath on his son, Jesus, on the cross. You see, the cross makes no sense unless we understand and comprehend God's utter disdain for sin and wickedness. That the cross is the worst, lowest moment in human history. That that the wrath of God is poured out on himself. But it's also the greatest moment of hope in human history. Because as dead, dry bones, we were incapable of getting to God by ourselves. But Jesus comes. He dies on the cross. He takes the wrath of God for us. He conquers death and rises from the dead. And then the picture of the gospel is death coming back to life. That's the picture of baptism. Death and life. The picture of the valley of dry bones is God saying, do you see these dead bones? By themselves, they are incapable of getting up. But God's will is to breathe new life into them. Just like in the creation account where God breathes life into Adam and Eve. God is saying that your life is dead, you're sinful, you're apart from me. But I, through the power of the cross, want to breathe new life into you. And here's the good news. That on our very, very worst day, when we think we couldn't possibly ever be loved by God again. We're, We're too evil. We're too wicked. On our very worst day, we still can't outrun the arms of God. You see, Romans 5, 8 says that while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. I love the way that the message puts it. He writes like this. He says, Christ arrives Right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for. And we can understand how someone good and noble can inspire us to selfless sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son and sacrificial death while we were of no use whatever to him. You can't make sense of the cross without the holiness of God and the wickedness of sin. But because of the cross, God gives us hope. It's recognizing that I can't get there by myself, but if I give my life to Jesus, Those dead bones come back to life. My heart is renewed. The Bible says the old is gone, the new has come. You're a new creation in Christ. If you aren't a Christian, if you've never given your life to God, man, take that step. God wants to breathe life into you. Maybe you are a Christian, 
but, but you're not part of a church family. The beauty of the church is this. It's a group of sinners coming together to try and recognize sin. And saying, if we love God, we are going to pursue holiness in our lifestyle. And sometimes that's uncomfortable. Sometimes that's, that means we step on each other's toes. Sometimes that means that we've got to wrestle with texts that we don't fully understand. But what God is promising is that what he started in us, he will see on through to fulfillment. That means that this process of sanctification, it's pursuing God together. It's throwing off the things of this world and saying, I want to live a life that is holy with God. I love the way that this pastor, Ray Ortland, puts it. He says this, the gospel says your shame is real, even more real than you know, but this is what God has done. He put it all onto Christ at the cross where your substitute was utterly shamed and exposed and condemned for you. Now your shame no longer defines you. What defines you, what reveals your future forever is this word, adorned. Not ashamed, adorned, lovely, attractive. And the moment is coming when he will look into your eyes with glad adoration and you will look into his eyes with confident surrender and nothing will ever ever spoil it again. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much, Lord, for difficult texts that you gave to us yesterday. They applied then, and you gave to us for today because they apply now. God, help us all to recognize that we are smaller than we realize, but you are so much bigger than we realize. God, help us to inwardly look at our lives to purge ourselves of those things that are keeping us from the fullness of our relationship with you. That as Christians, we, we need to be looking at what are those things in our life that are sinful and recognizing that, that you hate those things in our life, and so we should hate those things in our life. That you're omniscient and omnipresent, that you see everything about us. God, I pray for anyone in this room that is dead, that they are apart from you, they don't know you, that they are a valley of dry bones. God, thank you for the truth of the cross. God, help them to understand that if they will give their life to Jesus, you can give them fullness. You can give them life, that you breathe new life into them. God, anyone in the room that doesn't have a church, use this invitation. We're not a perfect church, but a church pursuing holiness together. It's in the name of Jesus we pray.